This program is brought to you by Emory University. Major League Baseball gives its fans the chance to see athletes perform at the outer edges of what is humanly possible. I know of nothing better in sport, any sport, than Willie Mays' famous catch or Roger Maris's epic quest to unseat Babe Ruth. But there's something to be said for ball fields without corporate box seats and games watched by crowds of two or three hundred. When did the minors begin? That's a complex question and probably there's no simple right answer. Obviously there can't be minor leagues until there's such a thing as a major league. And when the first major league was created can be a matter of dispute. The oldest professional organization was the Cincinnati Red Stockings in 1869 and the National League was established late in 1875. That's why incidentally you sometimes hear broadcasters refer to the National League as the senior circuit and that's why Cincinnati for years was given the honor of opening the new baseball season. That organization called themselves the National League of Professional Baseball Clubs but the name was not new. Several years previously the players themselves had formed the National Association of Professional Baseball Players they drew up a constitution and created schedules for competition among the various clubs to which the players belonged. So during the last decades of the 19th century, there were numerous professional baseball clubs that played in different associations or leagues. And which of those playing circuits were minor and which were major would have been a matter of opinion. In the winter of 1902 and 1903, the newer American League and the National League both adopted a national agreement which ended years of self-destructive squabbling over turf and players. These two leagues included existing teams from the Boston Braves, New York Giants, Brooklyn the Dodgers, Philadelphia Phillies, Pittsburgh Pirates, Cincinnati Reds, Chicago Cubs, and St. Louis Cardinals as the National League, and from Boston the Red Sox, New York the Yankees, Philadelphia the Athletics, Washington the Senators, St. Louis the Browns, Cleveland, the Indians, Detroit, the Tigers, and Chicago and the White Sox for the American League. This arrangement was to last for more than half a century, and it makes up what is often called baseball's golden age. It ended in the mid-50s when several teams, the Boston Braves, New York Giants, Brooklyn Dodgers, began moving west. Clubs not part of these two leagues also signed the agreement as third parties becoming, in effect, minor leagues. But note that during the 1930s, the quality of baseball in the Negro League teams was by many accounts every bit as good as in the so-called majors. And very high level minor league baseball was being played in the International League as well as on the West Coast. The more you learn about minor league baseball, one of the lasting things you take with you is the insight that, very that often very little, if anything, separates the players who make it to the majors from the ones who do not. In every generation of baseball players, there are always a handful of superbly gifted athletes who seem built to one purpose and one purpose only, to excel on a baseball field and to stretch the game and its possibilities to its limits. These players are the legends of the game. Matheson, Johnson, Cobb, Ruth, Gehrig, DiMaggio, Robinson, Mantle, Mays, Koufax, Aaron, Clemente, Bonds. But superstars are rare in baseball, as in any other human endeavor. The cold fact is that even at the major league level, most play only a supporting role. And it's at this level of performance that one should be careful in attributing success to innate talent or hard work. It's an error, for example, to suppose that the average AAA team could not complete a creditable season if on opening day their talents and work habits were somehow implanted surgically into the bodies of the players on their parent club. And it's an even greater error to suppose that the average individual AAA ball player could not put together a productive 8 or 14 year career in the majors if he somehow caught a break at just the right time. When he was considering raising one of his subordinate officers to the rank of general, Napoleon didn't ask how good a soldier he was. He asked and said, was the man lucky? I like to think about that in Heart of the Game and its tale of hard luck and missed opportunities in connection with another baseball biography, Lee Montville's story of Babe Ruth. You remember the early life of Babe Ruth? 
playing ball in obscurity at a Baltimore orphanage and trade school. The babe got his first and what might have been his only look from a scout through pure luck. A man named Jack Dunn, a scout for the minor league Baltimore Orioles, wanted to sign a pitcher named Ford Meadows from the St. Joseph's Orphanage. But because Brother Gilbert of St. Joseph's didn't want to lose Meadows, he sent Dunn away with a recommendation that instead he look at this left-hand pitcher from St. Mary's, name of Ruth. Ruth, great as he was, needed to catch a break. What's often left out of any player equation, writes our author for this week, S.L. Price, what's often left out of any player equation is the voice of an angel. I can give you an example. I have a set speech, I say, whenever a student comes to my office to ask for advice about graduate school in English and about life as a college teacher. First, I tell them, how can you beat it? You get paid to think and to tell people what you think. But next, I tell them a soberer truth, that for every job like mine, there are on average more than 100 applicants. Most of them are highly qualified in possessing the necessary talent and work ethic. I tell them that on average, graduate schools in the United States turn out about 1,000 new PhDs in English each year, and that also on average about half that many jobs open up. Those numbers haven't budged much up or down for the last 40 years. And so when you finish your degree and begin to look for your first job, you're competing not only with the people who graduated when you did, but with those who graduated last year, the year before that, and the year before that. And I tell them that in 1979, when I got my PhD, the overall numbers were just as bad. But at least in 1979, three of every four new jobs were full-time positions that could eventually lead to tenure. Now, in a chronic down market, only one in four is tenure line. There are countless stories about people who finish their degrees with little or no hope of ever making a living doing what they have prepared so long and diligently to do. That's the hardest thing when it dawns on you at age 27 or 31 or even 34 that you've done everything right and can still lose. America isn't supposed to work like that, but the minor leagues often do. And in reading Heart of the Game, you learn about one of the times, one of the many times, that kind of bad luck happened in baseball. What lesson can we take from the story of Mike Coolbaugh? I see two, and Price captures both of them eloquently. The first is purely and simply tragic. Price narrates. Each time Scott tried to write it, his brother's death, tried to write it off as a mystery, putting the accident into a compartment in his mind where he could keep it controlled, he would bump up against the other unavoidable conclusion. Here it was, the last and worst war story you ever heard, the final sad proof of how snake bit Mike had been his whole life. How, yes, the game had screwed him beyond all the millions of screwings it had perpetrated on unsuspecting ball players for the last 130 years. And Scott would find himself crying all over again. The second is more difficult and mysterious. Again, Price quotes the words of a close family member. Mike's sister-in-law, Katie Pavlovsky. She said, as an outsider, I don't know anybody who wouldn't envy what they had. I would take the seven and a half years of marriage and the years they dated before that over any other option. It was that strong and powerful. Worthiness in life, as in literature, has more to do with the quality of a thing than with its absolute duration. Nobody would call the 18th century novel Clarissa more worthy than The Old Man and the Sea just because Samuel Richardson wrote almost a million words compared to Hemingway's mere 27,000. Just the opposite, in fact. I can't pretend to know the answer to the question as to Hugh's view of the life of Mike Coolbaugh, Scott's or Katie's, represents the more truthful summation. But it's a question you might want to ponder on your own. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.